Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Uh, this is the Mar uh, September 21st, 2020 meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey, and with us tonight we have Vice Chair Steve Carter, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. So uh, if you would join me in prayer, uh, and then we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the prayer that I have tonight is uh, by George Washington. And um, if you're not a person in prayer, don't take care to pray. That's perfectly fine. We don't want anybody to violate their conscience. Uh, I was a history major when I was in Carolina, so I enjoy history, and I enjoy especially learning about uh, George Washington. Uh, so this is uh, President Washington's prayer. My first act as president is a prayer. I ask you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and thank you for your love. Accept our thanks for the peace that yields this day and the shared faith that makes this continuance likely. Make us strong to do your work, willing to heed and hear your will, and write on our hearts these words, use power to help people. For we are given power not to advance our own purposes, nor to make a great show in the world, nor a name. There is but one just use of power, and it is to serve people. Help us to remember it, Lord. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave or for us or forsake us, so that he may incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways, that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. Amen. 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 Can you join me in the pledge? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the first uh, item for business is uh, public speakers who wish to be heard about agenda-related items. Uh, and we have one speaker signed up for that, and that is Faith Cook. Is Faith Cook here or in the overflow room? speakers so no commissioners responses next item is approval of the agenda motion to approve second. second we have a motion by mr carter to approve the agenda and a second by mr boswell if there's no discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed the next item is approval of the consent agenda so moved second we have a motion by Mr. Lashley to approve the consent agenda and a second by Mr. Carter. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. The first item of business is uh, a request for an excise tax refund. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, you have before you, for your consideration this evening, a request from CSC Global. Uh, indicating that they paid an uh, excise tax in the amount of $25,000 in error and are requesting that they be refunded uh, those dollars. The commissioners are authorized to approve this, uh, but uh, it does take action from the board. At this time, we have Mr. Hassani Myers from CSL, CSC Global that is joining us uh, via Zoom. So I think uh, Bruce Walker will be bringing him up on screen for you to interact with. Mr. Myers, there we go. Yes, yes. Hi, Hi. Hi Mr. Myers. Uh, welcome to our meeting. 
And do you have a presentation or something that you would like to say about the uh, request for your excise tax to be refunded? Um, no, no presentation or anything, but um, hopefully you all was able to review the letter that was sent. Essentially, it's just detailing the, the fact that the matter being uh, $25,000 was entered into the excise tax um, portion of indexing instead of $0 for the federal credit union that this document was submitted on behalf of. So, um, Really, really, the letter is still explanatory. So, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So, Commissioners, a copy of that letter has been included in your packet, as well as a copy of the deed of trust, and then a memo from uh, Ms. Frank, our clerk, uh, to Mr. Myers about this proceedings. And we have heard no objection from the Register of Deeds Office uh, to the possibility that the Commissioners may reimburse. Uh, CSC what's your what's your thoughts on the matter? I would suggest the board uh, reimburse the tax to the company. Yeah. I'll make the motion. Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lashley. Has made a um, motion to approve the refund of the money, and Mr. Boswell has seconded it. Uh, just take a moment to note that this is styled on our agenda as a public hearing, but. We don't have to vote to open and close the public hearing and so forth uh, to uh, properly address the item on the agenda. It's just to vote whether to refund the money. Is that correct? That is correct. So is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Motion carries. So uh, how is he going to get his $25,000 back? We'll put in a request through the finance department and reimburse them by check. So, and how long do you think that'll take? Because <clears throat> that's a lot of money. What's that? Well, <laughs> Madam Chair, he has to refile the document with the registered deeds, the correct document. Then he can be refunded the money. Okay. Did you hear that, Mr. Hassan? Uh, I want to make sure I heard it correctly. I have to refile that document with the correct information. Yes. That's correct. Okay. okay. All right. Do you have any other questions for us about how to proceed now? Um. So, how would I know that the um, the refund is you know the process has begun after the refiling uh, said document? I would suggest, uh, Mr. Myers, that you um, reach back out to myself or to Miss Frank and let us know that you resubmitted the correct document. If you'll let us know. We'll be sure and coordinate with the Register of Deeds Office to follow that process. Once it's done, to everyone's satisfaction, we'll remit your payment. All right, sounds good. And um, I believe that is all the questions I have. Okay, well, thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you. Good luck to you. All right, so the next item on the agenda is a public hearing for the Community Development Block Grant. And I believe that before we open the public hearing for that, Tanya Cattle, our planning director, is going to talk about the citizen participation plan that we need to uh, consider a motion of whether to approve the citizen participation plan. And then we'll look at opening a public hearing for the grant. Is that right? That sounds right. Great. So what we have before you tonight is the first of two public hearings required for the CDBG coronavirus uh, grant application process. Part of that process with CBG in particular, not just the coronavirus part, is the, um, the participation plan. Each county does have to submit a plan of how you anticipate uh, citizens being able to be a part of that process. Y'all have before you is just a couple pages. What we've got is the ability, if there's an advisory committee that's created, citizens could participate in that. They participate in the public hearings and they can invite, uh, number three, provide individual citizen efforts in the form of comments, complaints, or inquiries submitted directly to the program administrator. This is just kind of a guideline for us to use as we go through this process. What we're looking at, the grant that we're looking at applying for is a 30 month grant. So it's almost a three year process that citizens would be able to ask questions and things. And then there's, this is done, if you do CDBG on a regular basis, this is done almost yearly, you keep this up to date. Uh, the addition to what the general 
guidelines were for citizen participation is that we added the virtual hearing piece to it since we're kind of in that place and as long as we need to use that it's there it's not something you always have to use but it's there if we need it and it's a pretty simple following is uh, generally follow the state guidelines for public hearings and how um, people can respond and gives information to who to contact during that process the attractive piece commissioners is that these funds do last for 30 months which is significantly beyond our current uh, coronavirus relief funding so uh, we're working with the health department then the department of social services and our it department on uses for these funds uh, to provide help with some additional money to take them past i think their uh, coronavirus money runs out next spring in the may time frame so this would help them go beyond that time frame uh, dss we're looking at being able to help uh, with some child care that are related to the COVID school closings that are going on. And then we're also going to be working with PTRC about how to spend these funds for broadband, some type of assistance for broadband service to the county. So. That's certainly needed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you need a motion to so we need, Yeah, we need an approval for the hearing. this part and then to set the second public hearing for October 19th. Well, I think the first motion we need is uh, to approve the citizen participation plan. I will make a motion that we Second. do that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boswell. has made a motion that we approve the citizen participation plan, and Mr. Carter has uh, seconded that. Uh, is there any discussion? Not all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, next we need to open a public hearing for the CDBG branch. So if we have a motion to open. I'll make a motion that we open the public Second. hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boswell. It's made a motion to open the public hearing. Mr. Lashley has made a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the public hearing for the community development block grant is now open. Uh, I'll ask, is there anybody on the right side of the room, my left, who wants to be heard about the community development block grant? Seeing no one, step forward. Uh, is there anybody on the left side of the room, my right, who wants to be heard about the community development block grant? Seeing no one, uh, can we check in the overflow room and see if there's anybody in there? Please. All right, there's nobody in the overflow room who wants to be heard about it. So there's nobody present who wants to be heard about the CDBG grant. And my understanding is that for this public hearing, we were not, uh, were we taking phone calls? We were, do we have anybody who wanted to be called? No, Madam Chair. All right, so there's nobody else. There's nobody who wants to be heard. Um, or for? written, no written comments. Either. And no written comments either. All right, so I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Carter has made a motion to close the public hearing and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. So uh, the next item on the agenda is to set the second public hearing for the community development block grant because we have to do two of them right so we just did one yeah. state law and the guidelines for this type of grant require the two public hearings so that request is for october 19th uh evening meeting and we will have ptrc here to do a presentation to break out the details of what we're looking at for this application at that time and that's the 7 p.m meeting yes i'll make a motion that we set that on October 19th. Okay, Mr. Boswell has set, made a motion that we set a public hearing for the Community Development Block Grant on October 19th, and Mr. Carter has seconded that motion. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. So we'll do it again. <laughs> That's fine. All right, the next item on our agenda is a request to set another public hearing for the revised heavy industrial development ordinance. 
So just a little background on this. We talked about this last month that we have a solar energy system ordinance that you all approved that's active now. So we want to take the high dough and the only adjustment we're making to that is pulling out solar energy just so it's up to date and there's no confusion with our ordinances. We're requesting a public hearing for that. That's required by state law. Motion to approve. And when do you want to have Hi. a public hearing? We're doing that on ten five, I believe, is what we're doing. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Ten five. Yes. At nine a.m. Yes. So, Mr. Carter, your uh, motion was to set a public hearing on the revised every industrial development ordinance for October fifth at nine a.m. That's correct. Second. And uh, Mr. Lashley, do you already second it? Yeah. Last night. Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, we have a motion and a second to set that public hearing. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right. Uh, next on the agenda is a COVID-19 update with Alex Rimmer, our interim health director. Hey, good evening, hey. commissioners. Thank good you evening. for having me. So we'll start with our daily case count from today. Um, we've had 3,855 cumulative cases. 3,534 are currently out of isolation. There's 266 active cases that are currently isolated. And of those 266, 12 are receiving hospital care. And there's been a total of 55 deaths in our community. So we'll go down to the weekly demographic report. Um, as you can see, around August 31st, there's a little bit of a spike. That's due a lot to congregant living facilities. So those would include long-term care facilities, the jail, things like that. Um, and then you can see the dip after that and then the increase again. Um, and this is a lag from Labor Day weekend, um, Elon University and things like that. So Elon University actually has their own dashboard and it's got their case count um, for the university separate from Alamance County, um, just for the public to be able to see that and the school as well. So we'll go to the next. So this is our cases in close contacts, um, like we show weekly. And so on the left side, um, I know we've talked about this a lot. So you've got your active cases, the 266. The released ones in orange, 3,534, and then you've got your deaths at the top showing our total cumulative case count there on the left. And then on the right, you've got your close contacts. So we're currently following 682 close contacts. Um, those are of the 266 active cases. And so these are the people under monitoring um, that we talk to, tell them when to be tested, where they can get tested, and we help monitor for symptoms. So here is a little bit of good news. So North Carolina's percent positivity is currently 5.4% um, and ours as of September 12th has gone down to 5.1. And so we're trending downward. Um, you know, we had been in se around seven and a half percent for a while in August and then we had a little bit of a spike um, and it started to come back down. So there has been a lot of testing in the community recently um, as we talked about the jail last time, there's been a lot of testing there. Um, there's been a lot of testing in long-term care facilities. Um, there's required testing by CMS. Um, so Medicare requires a lot of testing weekly um, in order to ensure that staff aren't bringing COVID into these facilities. And so, um, you know, the, the overall trend is that the majority of the tests are coming back negative. Um, so we currently have five outbreaks in long-term care facilities. And um, just as a reminder, an outbreak would constitute two positive cases within 28 days. So that's pretty easy to do if you think about you're doing surveillance testing every week. It's pretty common to get to within 28 days. So um, these folks are being able to be isolated before they um, spread COVID in the facility, which is a really good thing to protect, especially the elderly population. So we'll go to the next slide. This is our cumulative case breakdown by race and ethnicity. Um, pretty similar to before. Um, we're continuing to work with our partners in the community, both Cone and Piedmont Health Services, to reach <laughs> our historically marginalized populations to offer testing. 
Um, there's a lot of different testing going on in the community. So um, the health department still has their fixed site. Um, we do it from 10 to 12, Monday through Friday by appointment. Um, Cone Health still has one at ARMC. It's moved. It's now at the visitor entrance, but there's it's no appointment. It's Monday through Friday, 8 to 3.30. Um, Piedmont Health Services is doing a lot of events. Um, they're going to Ray Street Academy, um, RL Pate Homes, Earl Grove Homes, things like that. Um, Elon First Baptist Church. Um, and those can all be found on Find My Testing Center um, website through NCDHHS. And then um, the Health Department and Cone Health have an event on the 26th together at Fairchild Community Center from 8.30 to 11.30. So a lot of different areas in the community that we've been able to target to bring testing to, um, especially those areas where um, folks don't have as much access to transportation. So this is our cumulative case breakdown by age. As you can see, uh, North Carolina is in the yellow and we're in the blue. We're trending very similarly to the state. Um, so nothing really has changed there. It's, it's all stayed pretty steady this whole time. So. And this is zip code. Um, so like we would expect, East Burlington and Burlington proper and Graham are the top three. Um, Elon's zip code 27244 has grown quite a bit in the past few weeks. Um, so, uh, again, largely due to the university. So, um, recently, once we reached the 50th death in the community, we decided to go ahead and stratify the deaths just to see a little bit um, of the data to see what race and ethnicity and what age groups these were coming from. Um, as you can see, we've got Alamance County's total population in green. We have got Alamance County deaths in blue and North Carolina deaths in yellow. So pretty similar to the state. Um, the one thing I do want to point out, like we were talking about going into those um, historically black communities and African-American communities, it's really important that we do that because the overall deaths is 30.9, whereas our population is 20.6. So, just trying to ensure that that testing is available um, in our community. And this is stratified by age group. Again, it compares North Carolina deaths to Alamance County deaths. Um, and so, again, very similar to the state. It's really hard to stratify 55 deaths. So, um, you know, the state is in, in the 3,000 range, and so it's a lot easier to see that data and kind of a little more accurate rep representation. Um, the one thing I do want to note is that 92.7% uh, of these um, COVID deaths that have happened do have underlying chronic health conditions. So a large, large number that our community has seen um, already had underlying chronic health conditions. And so I'm sure you all would like an update on the jail. And so um, we are continuing to do weekly testing there and we will continue to do that until we have 14 consecutive days with all negative tests. And so um, the recommendation from NCDHHS is to test between three to seven days anytime in that window. And so that's what we're doing. Um, and last week we only had three positive cases. And so actually one of those has been transferred so there's only two positive cases that are still there and they are currently in isolation. And um, Southern Health Partners is testing those that are being, um, I guess, upon arrival. Mm -hmm. So the detainees upon arrival. Are they quarantined when they bring them in for X amount of days till they get results back? Is that they are. So um, they're quarantined when they come in and they're given a test and um, it's my understanding they're actually quarantined longer than when the test results come back. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. They're going ahead and quarantining them for that full full time period. So. Let me ask, if y'all go out and arrest somebody and you, you bring them into the jail, do you test them at that time before you bring them in? They are screened. Okay. And then if they have to come into the jail, they will be tested. If they go before That's a magistrate true. and receive a bond, they, they leave. 
Are there any other questions? We got, um, well, I'm going to have to. Oh, could we get up the Elon uh, thing? I'd like to know, so you had said how many people do we have active now? And For I'm, the overall elements? Yeah. So 266. And so how many of those are Elon students? I don't, I don't have that specific number with me. So we're not, as the health department, we're not tracking them separately. Um, and so I don't, I don't have that number. So does, does Elon count as a congregate living? Like so if they're in dorms? It's a little bit different the way the state does colleges and universities. So they don't publicly um, put them on the dashboard the same way they would a jail or correctional facility or um, nursing home. And so they're not publicly released. Okay, can we tell from looking at the information online how many of our cases come from Elon? Yeah, so there's 90, it's, and that's estimated, so it wouldn't be quite as accurate as our numbers um, that are currently Elon. So I'm sorry I have a hard time seeing that from over here, especially with my glasses fogging up, <laughs> the mask on. Can you help me to understand yeah, so, what it means? So the, on the left side, they've got their new cases. So there was eight new cases in the past 24 hours. Um, then estimated active cases is 90. So um, you take our 266 and the 90, and that would give you roughly how many were just general Alamance County residents. Um, and then it shows you similar to how we do persons under monitoring. They've got students in quarantine or isolation is 279. So I'm not sure the way they do their data if that's going to be your active cases and your quarantine or if it's just technically quarantine with the way they say that um, and zero hospitalized. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, I've got uh, one. Are you testing everyone at the university? So they're doing weekly surveillance testing at the university um, with a private lab. Sorry. No, no, I'm fine. Uh, you know, the public schools are shut down virtually, just <clears throat> like forts. Uh, yet you go to certain private schools or uh, private, and they're large, and they're they had the option to either go or do virtual, but they're all there. They're playing soccer. I'm sure the parents love them, love their children. Like a school I pointed out to our county manager, the parents pay $10,000 a year for their kids to go to school there. 14 if they're not a particular religion. If a child comes up, one of these students comes up with the uh, virus in these schools that are already open, what is the protocol from the health departments. I assume we've got charter, uh, private schools in our county that's going. I, I don't know. I don't keep up with it. We, we do have a few. And so we do weekly meetings with the schools that are open. Um, and we have guidance from the state that's really specific about what's required and what's not and how to try to keep things very isolated. So let's say there's a child that's positive in one classroom. If they follow the protocols, then really the most that would be out would be that classroom. And so it's really important that um, there's a partnership there, and especially um, with Alamance Burlington Schools, we've been working with them really closely for the past several months trying to figure out when they do go back, we've answered questions and tried to come up with plans ahead of time um, so that we're not all trying to figure it out as we go along. So you're saying that if, if a student in one classroom came out the virus just that classroom alone it depends on how the close contacts are and how the school mm -hmm. is set up but especially when you think about like k through five or something like that where they're not changing classes so much they're kind of the same cohort the whole time it's a lot easier to control those types of situations versus when you think about high school and you think about they're going to four different classes a day at least and so they're in around four different groups of students well, is it mandatory that they have to do these things or just suggested? So for public schools, it is. It's, yeah. it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. But a private school, it could be. They're, they're, they still follow the same executive orders. All I know is that there's protests all over 
by good people that want their kids back to schools. That's exactly right. Yeah. And uh, the school you. board should be ashamed of theirself not to vote for the students to go back. Well, um, one of the, if I remember right, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the metrics that the Raleigh's looking at to decide whether they can go back is the percent positive, and it was a threshold of five they were hoping for. Now Mance County's at 5.1. What, what did you say the state's at? 5.4. So. Yeah, we're, hit, we're just a little bit lower than the, the state percent positivity right this second. Anybody else? Any I know we're working the homeschool aspect for our grandson, and it is a we've got a wife about to go to Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord! I'm she was a teacher, got plenty right? of county <laughs> stuff to do that <laughs> she's taking care of, and she's a retired teacher, so it helps a lot. So, but uh, computers are driving the students crazy. They go down, they lock up in the class in the middle of a class session. Are there any other questions? Okay. Looks like not. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is a budget amendment for DSS. We have Director Adrian Day here. Good evening. Welcome. Hey, Adrian, yeah. how are you doing? Hello, I'm Adrian. Leo, how about you all? I'm doing good. Good, thank you for having me tonight. So we have um, CARES Act funds for Adult Protective Services and Child Protective Services. These funds are allocated from DHHS in the amount of $133,670. There's no county match to it. Um, we have to spend these funds by, technically for us, we have to spend them by December 15th to be able to claim reimbursement for them. So I'm just asking tonight to um, have these, um, these accounts established. How much is a colossal waste of my time? I don't know. Perhaps yeah. not muted. I don't know. How about, how about, yeah. We had a motion to approve that, <laughs> and I'll second it. How about that was Thomas? No. <laughs> I thought it was Darth Vader over there. <laughs> I thought it was Darth. What was that? I don't know. It was Thomas talking. No, no. I didn't open my mouth. Not this time. This is the one. Yeah, it wasn't Thomas. <laughs> All right, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell to approve the uh, budget amendment for DSS. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Anyone opposed? Hey, man, I didn't know you could throw your voice that way. No, yeah. no, that wasn't me. <laughs> that can sound just like Thomas. That was not me. <laughs> that didn't sound like um, Well, whatever. <laughs> so uh, next thing on the agenda is another budget amendment for DSS. Yes. So we um, last year we participated mm -hmm. in um, Shift NC, which is a sexual health initiative for our teens. Um, and so this year they asked us to sign on with them, but initially there was no money tied to this. Um, and then we got a sub award for eight thousand um, dollars. So it's going to be two thousand dollars awarded to us each quarter so I'm just asking that you um, again there's no county match to this so asking that you um, approve these funds as well make a motion. motion that we approve second okay we have a motion by mr. Basel and a second by mr. Carter to approve the budget amendment if there's no discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed all right thank you very Good much to see you again hey, thank you. <laughs> All right, next item on our agenda are the public speakers, people who have signed up. Uh, I'll just work my way down the list. First person signed up is Azure Walker Robertson. Welcome, Ms. Walker Robertson. Um, uh, if you would uh, state your name and give us uh, your address or the town where you live. Uh, my and name is Azure Walker Robertson, and I live in Graham, North Carolina. 
Okay, great. You can start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Due to the negligence of our county leaders, there is an outbreak of COVID-19 in our jails. This is once again brutality against black bodies, the disenfranchised, and underrepresented. Based on the behavior of local county officials, it is obvious you have no desire to ease the burdens on community members who are consistently, consistently marginalized due to white supremacist systems and values. So once again, based on behavior, we have 287G, the COVID outbreak in county jail, various attempts to dissuade free speech, and white supremacist rallies with impunity. Based on behavior, black and brown bodies are in harm's way due to the decisions of this council and the local sheriff's office. I'm not here to urge you to listen to us. I'm not here to, I know you hear us. Excuse me, I lost my spot, trying to make eye contact. I'm not here to urge you to listen to us. You hear us. You just refuse to be decent or demonstrate any moral compass. We are here today and every day to hold you accountable and make you uncomfortable. There are no outside agitators. We are citizens of Graham, North Carolina and Alamance County, and you will start acting, listening, and behaving in a way that honors and benefits all your constituents, or we will vote you out. Our vote is powerful. We are awake. We see you, and we will continue to fight for policy change that will positively affect black and indigenous people of color. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. All right, the next person on the list is Jonathan Nelms, who wanted to be called. Mm Jonathan Nelms. I'm unable to answer. All right, so it's unfortunate Mr. Nelms not answer. So we will go on to the next speaker, which is Katie Cassette. Sorry, I couldn't hear that, Katie. Cassette, C A S S E T T E. Ms. Cassette. Hello, good evening. If you would please um, tell us your name and the area that you, the county that you live in. My name is Katie Cassette. I live in Graham, North Carolina. I heard you all in the last county commissioner's meeting talking about how removing that monument would be just like removing history itself, how we should protect history. I am quoting one of you when I say, well, that's how we learn our history. If we forget history, we will not know where we came from and we will not know where we're going. Public monuments serve as a selective lens on the past. There is no way to walk past that monument, even if you took time to stare at it for three hours and get the context to where that statue fits in our history of this town. Did you know before and during the Civil War, Alamance County was a hotbed of militant unionists and resistance to secession and the Confederacy? In March of 1861, Alamance County voted overwhelmingly against leaving the Union, 1,114 to 254. Alamance was at the center of the North Carolina Quaker Belt, most held anti-slavery beliefs and opposed secession and the Confederacy. Graham was also a town that elected its first black constable and councilman, a community organizer, a builder of schools, and the first black church here in Graham, and that man was Wyatt Outlaw. So how did we get from that Graham to this one? Wyatt Outlaw was dragged out of his home by white supremacists, the KKK, one cold February night in 1867 and hung right there in that town square from an elm tree, very close to where that statue stands. 
Again, public monuments serve as a selective lens on the past. When members of a community erect a monument, they are making a statement about their ideas and values or individuals they think their society should remember. So who are these members of the community who decided what our ideas and our values are? Jacob Long and Henry London. Jacob Long and Henry London are two men responsible for erecting the monument. Henry London was a white supremacist that lobbied hard to suppress the black vote with literacy tests and poll taxes, who was quoted saying, now it is determined that white supremacy shall be made permanent by ridding the state of the ignorant Negro vote. Jacob Long founded the Alamance chapter of the KKK and called for the lynching of Wyatt Outlaw. The history of Alamance County was hijacked by white supremacists, the history was stolen, and a monument was erected. That monument does not tell a story of truth or honor, but of murder, racism, and hate. Your memorial and glorification of white supremacy is causing unease in this town. Even NASCAR agrees, even UPS agrees that that is a hateful symbol. Take it down before someone gets hurt. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Cassette. Uh, the next speaker is Jamie Pollard. Paul, and if you would begin by telling us your name and the area that you live in or your address, and then you can start when you're ready. Um, my name is Jamie Paulin. I live in Orange County, North Carolina. Um, I'm here um, to speak with you. I'm an attorney. I now represent, um, I think, eight people who have been charged in um, relation to issues that surround this Confederate monument. And, you know, I came up here today and I walk into the overflow room and, and I'm, I've done public comment before, so I'm not expecting anybody to answer, but do you have any idea how many law enforcement officers you have in that room? Because I counted 18. 18 law enforcement officers for four public speakers. So, and, and if you look amongst yourselves, do you see any people of color represented amongst yourselves? There's a real problem in Alamance County. There's a problem with race. There's a problem with the use of law enforcement. It all started with a friend of mine contacting me when um, she was charged for, basically for uh, cursing at Confederates out on the square. That was the first call I got about a month ago. And since then, you've had somebody charged for speaking at a public hearing in this very room uh, you had someone else at that meeting charged with assault, actually two other people charged with assault, but one of them uh, coming from our standpoint. Then we had a photographer who was uh, charged relating to um, when he defended a woman who was being shoved by a Confederate in town. Then we had a young man who was charged for breaking up a fight between his girlfriend and his cousin. And by the way, he was charged with assaulting his cousin and then put in the jail on a domestic violence hold. That is not, I was a magistrate in Orange County, that is not uh, a, a basis for charging or for holding somebody in a domestic violence hold. I spent I spent hours on a Saturday trying to reach somebody to say this person does not belong in this jail on a hold. He should have been charged if they were going to charge him and he should have been released. Then I had a, a friend who was charged for accidentally hitting a car when she was leaving an event. She was charged with um, for uh, uh, having an out-of-state driver's license and then um, for hitting a car. And then to top it all off, we had a demonstration last week outside of this very building. I was there because supporting my friends, and all we did was decide we were going to march down, we were going to wave to the people in the jail. And when uh, a, a young gentleman of color was walking through that parking lot and wasn't moving fast enough for the sheriff's office, they were yelling at us to get onto the sidewalk. He was skipping with a bunch of balloons, and they tackled him and violently arrested him. And then next, they arrested a uh, woman who owns a business here in town. Um, I'm not. 
a conclusion or to wrap it up? Yeah. Uh, there were two other people charged at this event. Um, all I want to say is Black Lives Matter. Please take down the monument. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Fallen. The next speaker is Ron Osborne. Please uh, state your name and give us the, your address or the general area where you live, and then start your comment. My name's Ron Osborne. I live in Graham. I've been appointed by my congregation to read this statement to this body. Spring Friends Meeting, a congregation of the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers, offers this statement regarding the ongoing debate over the Confederate statue in Alamance County. As a faith community established in 1761, predating the founding of our nation by 15 years and the establishment of our county by 88, we inherit a deep-seated responsibility to actively promote peace and justice around the world as well as in our own community. We believe that the promotion of such sacred ideals needs our attention and our action, which is long overdue here in our own home. These ideals are best served when vestiges of past injustice are recognized and acknowledged, and when we hold ourselves accountable to redress them. The Confederate statue is such an icon. We appreciate that many of our neighbors consider the monument to stand as a tribute to past heroism and the faithful duty of our forebears. Yet the historical words and deeds of the individuals who erected this statue prove indisputably that the presence was equally intended to serve as a symbol of supremacy of the white race and as an effort to maintain that status quo. The statue's prominence in the shadows of the courthouse and edifice committed to serving all citizens equally and justly belies that mission. History proves that those who dedicated the monument were the very perpetrators of the brutal lynching of Wyatt Outlaw, which took place only steps away. To continue to permit the statue to remain in this public place of justice is to perpetuate the dark spirit of those who erected it as well as to turn a blind eye to the crime that presaged it. And though our elected leaders claim they have no legal authority to address the moving of the statue, they should understand they have a moral duty to do so. In a spirit of reconciliation, we advocate not for the destruction of the monument, but rather its relocation to a more appropriate venue away from our courthouse and public squares within a museum or other historically proper place where the entirety of its story can be presented and preserved for posterity. We members of Spring Friends Meeting hence declare that we pledge to hold ourselves accountable to standing on the right and just side of history regarding this matter. And we appeal to our neighbors and elected leaders to stand with us. And I would like to add that our congregation has discussed what options this board could pursue despite the general statute's impediment. This board could adopt a statement regarding the need to address the monument. This board could place signage around the statue which faithfully explains a full history regarding the monument in the, the real context. They could publicly and formally call on the leg county's legislative representatives to have the general statute amended. They could erect a memorial to Wyatt Outlaw to reveal a fuller history of our county. And the board could organize a commission of sincerely concerned citizens and appropriate experts to civilly discuss the issue and recommend an outcome. Or this board can continue to do nothing of real substance to address the matter. Mr. Osborne, your time is uh, over, so if you would have a concluding sentence to wrap it up, we appreciate it. We pray that, as Lincoln said, the better angels of our nature will guide you to positive action, which will promote reconciliation and equal justice for all, not just for some of our citizens regarding this weighty matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. The next speaker uh, who signed up is Michael Graves. He submitted, I believe, written comments. Yes, ma'am, 
Mr. Osborne, if you want to stay in here, um, after we hear Michael, it's up to you, but after we hear Mr. Graves' written comment, I'm going to suggest that we bring the other public speakers from the overflow room, so instead of going in there and then coming back, you may sure. just have a seat since uh, we don't really have hardly anybody in here. If you go ahead. Okay. First, I would like to ask that as members of the Republican Party, but more importantly, as leaders in our community, that you denounce the racist rhetoric that was yelled at fellow citizens from the truck convoy that rolled through Alamance County supporting Trump. This county should not be a place for that type of rhetoric from either side of the political spectrum or supporters of either candidate. I again ask you to denounce their actions. Also, it is not lost on me that Commissioner Carter asked me to sit down and discuss the statue with the organizer of the event, the founder of taking Alamance County back. The Alamance County GOP thought it was in poor taste to even meet or associate themselves with this individual and group and declined to appear with them, but yet Commissioner Carter thought it would be okay for me to sit down with this person. On the subject of the statue, I have tried to be diplomatic and offered, I think, a reasonable option as to the relocation of the statue to a place of prominence and respect, although that it is more than what it deserves. I have stated that it be placed in a museum with people who want to honor those individuals can do so. It would also be protected in that museum, so the concerns of Sutton would also be taken care of. I also stated that I would not be for any removal of Confederate soldiers' names from the wall in front of the new courthouse, but that's not good enough, so I am through with diplomacy. Now Commissioner Carter has convened a group of people who by his own admission have no authority along with the commissioners to do anything. So, my, so why meet with these individuals to suggest any options for the statue if commissioners are powerless to do anything. If according to the county attorney, it is illegal to move it, although he never answered why all the municipalities in this state moved theirs, nor did he answer, did the General Assembly meet in private just for those municipalities? Nor did he answer if there was any negative retribution to those municipalities for removing their statues. Did the South rise again or did Governor Cooper Cooper come to the municipalities with a gun in demand that they put the statue back up. What happens? But Commissioner Carter has come up with an insane option of putting a statue of Wyatt Outlaw beside the Confederate soldier. Nobody decent in Alamance County will go for that. Wyatt Outlaw was a duly appointed law enforcement official sworn to uphold the laws of the United States. And now you have the advice of the county attorney, if you want to call it that. The county attorney is to advise of the legality of an issue, not interject personal feelings. After months of bad information. Um, Clerk Frank, is, oh, it, is he almost finished? No, Madam Chair. All right, I was uh, <laughs> keeping time. We started okay. at 7.49 and 41 seconds, and now it's past 7.52 and 41 seconds. So. Okay. Um, we'll end that yeah, comment because yes. he gets his three minutes like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So if you would please, Mr. Payne, ask uh, the people in the overflow room to come in here because there's plenty of space. Madam Chair, may we get a copy of that correspondence? Sure, of course. Yeah. yeah I couldn't hear it, so I'd like to be able to Yeah, you definitely need to hear that. <laughs> yeah, you definitely need a copy of that. That is really a lot about you. Well, I know. I thought so, y'all were buddies. Come on a, in and have a, a seat. Is there anybody else in there? Just one doesn't wish to come over. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. We just have plenty of room, so the overflow room is for overflow. We're underflowed tonight. So that's why I asked if anybody wanted to come in here, they're welcome. So uh, do we have any commissioner responses? No, I'd like to ask uh, Pastor, uh, uh, what's his name? Osborne. Osborne. Your church, is that where the uh, Revolutionary War soldiers, uh, they went there before or after Guilford Courthouse? 
that would be Cane Creek meeting. Our, Cane Creek. Our yeah. meeting house is where the Battle of Lindley's Mill took place. I got you. So it's not the same. Yes. Okay. I've been around the bushes down at both of them, but it's been <laughs> 20 years ago. Just want to ask. We have Revolutionary War soldiers buried from the Battle of Lindley Mill in our burial ground. Okay. Uh, you've missed a public speaker that signed up. Miss Cook was signed up for speaking. Thanks, Cook. Oh, we called her name and it was marked as an agenda related item and she wasn't here, so we moved forward. So that's uh She's here and she'd like to speak. Well, she wasn't here when her name was called and that's how we treat everybody. You have to be here when your name is called. And so that's how it goes. Um, do we have any other commissioner responses? Commissioner Ms. Carl? I'll address my comments directly to Mr. Graves. Save your prayer. Mr. Seth? Oh, I'm fine. Cooper said. Yeah. Well, I would definitely, I have one thing that I would definitely like to say. Um, I was not, uh, Mr. Graves referenced the convoy that came through the county on Saturday. I was not there. I did not personally observe what happened. I don't know what happened, but I saw some pictures um, that allegedly were taken, I guess, in Courthouse Square after the event. And I was just disgusted and horrified by uh, what I saw. And it was actually obscene and not something that decent people should be describing, and, you know. So I don't, anybody else who's seen it knows what I'm talking about. And there is just no place in our community for people who would shout racist rhetoric, like white power or something like that was allegedly shouted from a truck in the convoy. Um, Mr. Graves brought that up. There is no place in our community for that. And there is no place in our community for people who would um, display obscenity from a face mask. And I was really disappointed in our community that um, that kind of ugliness surfaced. And um, I, was in, I was embarrassed for Alamance County. And um, honestly, I'm embarrassed to think that those people would call themselves the same political party that I am. Because that's not what the party that I belong to stands for. That's not what I stand for. And um, I found it to be really disgusting and repulsive. Oh. So I do want to mention that. Um, there was also, I think it was uh, Mr. Osborne, I think one of the things that you were mentioning, Pastor Osborne, one of the things you mentioned in your op options was a memorial to Wyatt Outlaw. I think that's one of the things that you mentioned. And I think that you and I had a conversation about that. And I think we've also received emails from you about that. And yes. I think that is a great idea. And um, I think that our community should kind of, it should find a way to pay tribute and honor Mr. Outlaw, who from everything that I've read about him was a remarkable uh, man of great courage and deserves to be remembered. And um, there has been discussion about how to uh, put together a memorial to Mr. Outlaw. Um, at this point, we don't have any firm plans in place. I don't know if any of the other commissioners want to address that. I might like to say something about that. Um, Mr. I was thinking about it. Mr. Graves talked about a discussion group I tried to put together that involved members of both sides of the community that are concerned about the monument. Um, Mr. Graves actually refused to participate with the discussion group on two different occasions. I encouraged him to get back in. He refused again after an, uh, another individual was added to the group who happens to also be black and he called her a racist. Um, The, the offer 
of, and I think he addresses. I heard, I couldn't hear everything that the clerk read. I'm sorry, but he offered, or, or there was an offer made on the uh, suggestion put on the table of putting the monument in context, exactly what you discussed, and. Four of the individuals who were probably the most adamantly opposed to the monument refused to show up for the last meeting. And I heard, to, I heard from two of them that they were under the assumption that there was a decision that had already been made. Well, we haven't voted for anything. We haven't discussed anything, so, or made any vote. But they would have had, I thought, the most opportunity to have input at that time, and they didn't show up. So I'm hoping uh, this, this, this discussion group was organized by Jerry Peterman and myself. It's an ad hoc discussion group, has no authority to do, do anything but perhaps bring back a, some suggestions. And we've discussed all the uh, directions that have been given to the commissioners by the county attorney and what options are available to us. And as I said, the, the recommendation from one party in the group was some sort of a monument erected either on behalf of Mr. Outlaw or another individual. Um, I think, uh, uh, I can't remember who the other, there were two other individuals mentioned. But at that time, um, two of the individuals who did show up that night, or that afternoon, thought the suggestion was worthy of discussion and agreed to take it back to uh, their groups and talk about those. Um, putting the monument in context, there was some discussion about some signage. Matter of fact, I've had somebody send me some examples of similar type signage that could be mounted around the monument. Um, but if you don't have one side of the argument show up, it's kind of hard to discuss it. And. Uh, so I hope they might they, they might collectively decide to show up next week and uh, join us. Um, as I said once before in here, this is a this is a thorny issue. There are a lot of sides to it. Uh, there's more than one perspective on it in the county, and uh, I don't know if we'll come up with a solution to it or not. But it's not for me to. It's not for me to decide. It's uh, all I'm. The, all, all Jerry Peterman and I are there to do is just kind of guide the guide the meeting and help them know what their options are. So it's like you reach a certain point where you get kind of tired of worrying about it. But thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I'd like to say, <clears throat> in a way, your group is kind of bidding, putting, you know, I'd like to know who's on these committees. I'd like to know who's well, it's not on. a committee. Or I'd like to know who's in the group. And uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Well. If you don't want to do it tonight, you know, you can get us a copy of it. But, uh, I don't have a I don't have a problem sharing individually the the, the people. Uh, I told uh, when we started we said we wouldn't try to make it a public issue just a just a ad hoc discussion group that people that are on both sides of the issue. Well, I'm sure you I wouldn't put together a group like that and not tell you about it and not tell you who's on it. I just said I didn't have a problem. We'll do it. But I we'll do it, do it then, in this, Steve. In this in this meeting. Yeah. This is happens to be public. You see, you no offense. All right, let's call it like it is. You told me you were going to not ask Graves to be on the committee anymore. Now you told me that. And I didn't after the last time. Well, didn't you just say tonight you're asking him to come back on? The first time I did. The second time he refused, and that's when I told you I wasn't going to ask him to come back. Okay. All right. I just don't want somebody out doing my bidding without me knowing who they are. And because all I know is that in politics you, you get past one hurdle and it's easier to get the second hurdle cleared and I want to know where the first hurdle is I want to know who's involved in that first hurdle and uh, but you won't have to worry about me in a couple months but uh, 
I support the outlaw recognition. You and I have talked about it. Mm -hmm. I've called around to different uh, different areas to get some uh, quotes on monuments or uh, sizes. I, I would just say that I would hope that it would not be uh, that it would be practical. That it would be uh, something that it was obvious, true from our hearts, and not a situation of placating any group, mm -hmm. any philosophy, and that uh, and that it was pretty true that we weren't doing it to calm anybody down. To, that you it just was just want to tell history. Yeah, and I don't have a better problem with that. And, and I said because Tory, Miss Frank got me the articles that uh, I had not read. I had just heard the end result. I had not heard all the things that led up to it. And I wanted to know that. And she got me some articles that uh, really just, really were stunning. And uh, I think it's part of the way we do that, you know, that we do something. But I think it needs to be practical and not uh, unpractical. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> so I'm ready to look at it as well as, you know, as soon as we can. Well, I agree, and um, you don't want it to look, uh, in a way, it comes across maybe as a little um, placating or mm -hmm. yeah. almost a little insulting to say, we hear you about this one thing, so we're going to address it with something else. Um, it's just, uh, from my point of view, the idea to have a memorial to white outlaw is grounded in the belief that he is independent of anything else going on in our community. He's worthy of a memorial. He's worthy of a monument. Um, and it should have been done a long time ago. Yeah. And the truth is you were instrumental in talking about this, getting it done way before all this broke out. Right. Technically. That so, is true. I did a lot of, yeah. actually Mr. Haygood and I um, invested a lot of time and energy into putting together an effort to come up with a, an effort to come up with an effort, an effort to come up with a structure of how to address the problem in a way that is sensitive to um, people's perspectives. And um, in the long run, that, that effort didn't bear any fruit, unfortunately. But I still think it's a good idea. There's another thing that I will throw out here, which has got, I don't know if it has anything to do with Alamance County Board of Commissioners or if it's a school board thing, but I've been thinking, and I haven't said anything to anybody about this, I've been thinking about the new high school, which is gonna need a name. And I've been wondering if the school system would consider naming the new high school, high school the Wyatt Outlaw High School. Naming the new high school after Mr. Outlaw. And I uh, saw the superintendent last week at a ribbon cutting for South Mebane Elementary School. And I didn't mention it to him. I just uh, asked him how the new high school is going to be named. And he said that they were working on a policy for that, if I remember right. But that uh, there was no uh, set structure for naming schools. So I think that my personal thought is that that would be an appropriate way, independent of the monument, independent of a memorial for Mr. Outlaw located in Graham, um, why not name the new high school after him and recognize his life that way? So, that's just a thought. <sighs> Does anybody have anything else they want to talk about? All right, then we'll move on to the county manager's report. Uh, yes, Commissioners, uh, you have in your packet a fiscal report for uh, August 2020 and uh, some notes worth noting in that report. Uh, as I've mentioned last meeting, sales tax revenue is up. We're doing very well in our sales tax revenue. Uh, uh, it appears that our 20% projection uh, is not going to pan out or at least not this far in the fiscal year, which is great news. As I said last time, for the months of March, April, May, and June, which we consider to be the COVID months, we're up 1.81% over uh, the previous year, which is amazing uh, to me. Very good news. 
We'll continue to track our sales tax revenue. Uh, it's also good to note the report indicates that property tax revenues are down $4.2 million. We talked with Jeremy today, that was through uh, August 31st. So Jeremy has looked again at property tax revenue as of uh, September 18th, close of business Friday, we're right on target right where we need to be. So we had uh, several things delayed. I think we had, we had chosen to delay business personal property to try to give businesses a break, paying their taxes. So uh, we're, we're seeing our sales tax coming in significantly so far above our projections and our property taxes are right on the money. Uh, and then our sales and service revenue is down about $1.3 million. That's a little concerning. We're gonna be looking at that, but uh, we're looking at some of the health and dental revenues as well as our ambulance fees and some other uh, uh, scattered revenues. But what I'd like to do is come back uh, on the, at the October 5th meeting and give you a more thorough analysis, do a presentation for the board to show you uh, what we're seeing with revenues, what we think it might mean, and uh, what we might be able to start thinking about bringing back uh, some of the, particularly some of the uh, personnel items uh, and uh, some of our other costs that we cut due to our concerns about what COVID would do to our economy and to our budget. So, Overall, right now, uh, revenues are looking pretty good. We're, we're in much better shape than we thought we would be, and I'll be presenting some more detailed information to you about it at the next meeting. Um, so if there's, is there any questions about the financial piece? Sounds good. If not, uh, one other piece. I've asked Bruce Walker just to give you a brief, uh, uh, in some insight into our efforts with broadband. I know we've been receiving, as you have, lots of concerns from county residents about broadband, they're working at home, their kids are at home. So I've asked Bruce just to touch, touch base for a moment on, uh, on what we're up to with our broadband efforts. Well, and anytime you get somebody that contacts you, a lot of you forward it to me, and I, I usually take the time to have a conversation with those folks to at least try to educate them on all their possibilities. There's no smoking gun when it comes to solving uh, the internet um, issue with the county. but. So just to remind everybody we, what we've been doing is you know, we've consolidated on our county webpage all the different uh, service providers in the area. Um, every time we get new information, we add to it. So uh, we have that available for folks. There's also the connections to some of the providers provide MiFi's or hotspots at a reduced rate because of COVID or if you're already a customer and they reduce your rate or increase your number of bandwidth that you can have. So all that sort of is in one place. Um, uh, some things that have been coming up is, of course, ABSS is, is giving out MiFi's or hotspots. I think they're on their third or four, four thousandth a number of MiFi's to give out. So all you have to do is call your local school and tell them you, you need help in that regard, and they have that for the semester. The libraries are also got a grant to get some, and they have theirs in place. But, mm -hmm. you know, that helps with cell coverage and stuff like that. There's still some places that as we all know, just don't have enough coverage or, or can't afford to do that. So um, a couple things, again, we're trying to, you know, what can we do with what we have and what the community has to help out folks? Uh, uh, so a couple of new things have come down the pike just in the last couple of weeks. So uh, I worked with the parks and the, the libraries. You may have saw the article in the paper about Community Connect, so we're working with the chamber. Um, with any folks that have uh, internet access at their business that they're willing to share, either in their parking lot or whatever, it's free, you know, Wi-Fi. If they uh, fill out the survey, which again, please contact the library. We'll also have it on our web page. But um, they get a sticker or they get a, a sign. I was actually went for a walk today um, downtown and First United Methodist Church has a little bottom left. They have a little sign out there. So again, they're they're reaching out and trying to help the folks. Uh, again, trying to maybe maybe some folks have to drive in or whatever, but at least they get a little bit closer than to their school. The schools also have opened up everything for their students in their parking lots and those kinds of things. And then the other thing that's come down the pike last week is uh, there was uh, the great grant project that was available to uh, higher tier counties than us. Well, they've released the funds to lower uh, different counties now, and we qualify now. We just found that out. We're trying to and we're partnering with PTRC to try to determine exactly what areas, and then they're, you know, they're gonna work with us to try and uh, identify companies that might take advantage and apply for that grant. Um, the deadline's October 14th, we just found that out, so we're rushing ahead to try to find some additional partners, maybe some extra competition. I talked to a, um, 
I won't name the company, but I talked to a company, was, you know, it's a, a bigger company, and they said, well, we've got plans, we just can't tell you what they are yet, we're not going to apply for the grant. Um, um, so there are definitely a lot of other folks out there that they want, you know, with this grant to come in and actually go into an area, obviously, of need and will be profitable. I mean, obviously, these companies want to be profitable as well. So maybe this grant grant can uh, help us bridge that gap. So. Those are just some of the things that are going on. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people are trying to figure out how do we do this. A lot of, you know, the reality is it's very expensive to put in the infrastructure. So, um, you know, so that's the status of what we're doing, and we continue to try. And again, I do not tire of those phone calls. I've helped a few folks, a few folks I couldn't help, you know, but at least they were very happy to get that phone call. And uh, again. The few that we do help, I was went through it myself. With my wife, I know that Amy, you're out in the county, and so we live it as well as uh, you know try to solve that problem. So, so any questions on that? Thank you, Bruce. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Anything else? That's all. Okay. Do we have any commissioner comments and follow up? I just have one comment that I wanted to make about uh, the loan program that we set up with our coronavirus relief funds. We, um, if everybody remembers, we entered a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce and with uh, some other entities, um, the Alamance Community Foundation, um, and then some others. And there's still there's money available mm -hmm. in that loan program. Uh, if people want to apply for it. Bruce, could you pull up the Chamber of Commerce website? Yep. And the application portal is on that. I just want to be sure that uh, the public is aware that if you have business losses related to the virus, then there is money available to you. Um, and there's a application through the Chamber of Commerce. So I think it's under their, yeah, their economic development. We click on that. Let's see, is there a thing over to the left? That's uh, small business loan. Yeah, there you go. Recovery mm -hmm. loan program. There you go. There you go. So that's it. The recovery loan program, and there's an application I think on there. And um, there's a lot of assistance available through the small business center at the community college. And it's just, uh, there's a lot of really good hearted people who really wanna help our small businesses with the recovery from the COVID. So I just strongly encourage anybody, any bars, any gyms, any hair salons, anybody, restaurants, Small business, yeah. yeah, any small business that's located in Alamance County that could use some help getting through what we've been through, then that's available. I think they've already approved one at about a hundred and a quarter, about one hundred twenty-five thousand. So I think uh, one hundred one thousand seven hundred dollars have been approved. Uh, six loans. They've had uh, applications from hair salons, restaurants, child care uh, centers, call centers. Uh, gyms, dog breeders, auto repair. They've had a very wide and diverse uh, group of businesses apply. So I think uh, there's still funding available. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can encourage folks to, to apply for it. There's still funding available, and if we don't use it, then it has to go back. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that would be a real shame. I think uh, the last word I heard was they they were processing two more that may add another hundred, excuse me, thirty-five thousand dollars to that hundred one thousand. So. It's, people are coming in with it, but uh, okay. Chair is correct. It's a, it's a really good program. Uh, hopefully these businesses will find it helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that is the end of my comment. Does anybody else have anything? Nope. Well, that being the case, uh, we'll be adjourned. Okay. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. 
Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.